Let me just check. Okay, welcome to Quarkus Insight number 10. There we go. So, uh, everything, hey. yeah, welcome. <laughs> so, we, we are like a whole crowd today. I'm back from vacation, and you guys last week tried to do something and didn't didn't work. <laughs> no, you are probably, probably essential to that, uh, you know, stream cast. So. Apparently. So, uh, anyway, uh, we got a busy schedule. Uh, we got four people. Um, but, uh, well, first we got... Oh, I'm Max, by the way, uh, Max Anderson, the Walking Quarkers, and uh, Georgius, if you want to just give a quick intro, and then uh, you had some news you want to cover for this time around. Oh. Uh, and I so apparently I there is feedback only when Max talks or when everybody talks. Uh, hi. I, um, I was getting feedback when Max was talking, so I, I think it's better now, so hopefully... Okay. I'll People, tell us if you hear feedback and whether we need to fix it. We'll uh, try and fix it as we go live. Maybe you had uh, the same problem I had around ECAM and setting yeah, up we'll, uh, we'll, systems, we'll check. Not, not propagating the system one. <laughs> All right, so hey. news. Go ahead, George. Okay, yeah, so news. So I'm pretty sure you've all heard that uh, we've released Quarkus 1.6. A lot of uh, interesting features in Quarkus 1.6. So um, as you've seen probably from the release announcement, like the most important ones uh, would be app CDs integration. So now Quarkus can generate your app CDs out of the box. Uh, what's, we have a Cassandra. What's that? App CDS, right? Yeah, App CDS. Yeah, sorry, from the JDK uh, App CDS. Um, sorry, I'm, sorry, I'm having a, a impossible time here because I'm hearing myself. I'm hearing everybody. Okay. Well, so App CDS. Uh, yeah, let me do it. Maybe you can try and fix it while uh, I'm saying it. Yeah. So uh, App CDS sure. is. Oh, so you uh, do know it. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a class data sharing. So it's a way to, inside the, or maybe you can say it better, Gunnar, because you've been exploring a lot of those things. <laughs> oh, that's what uh, I can recently. say. <laughs> yeah, right. go for All right. it. Okay, so the idea is, uh, it's an improvement or an optimization in, in the JVM. And the idea is, instead of loading all the classes from the actual class files, uh, what you can do is you can essentially run your application and then persist the state of all the loaded classes into some kind of file which just persists the in-memory structure of all those uh, class metadata. And then when the JVM restarts for your actual application runtime, it just will have to memory map that file and that's much, much quicker um, than actually going and loading all the class files from the jars. And this gives a nice um, startup, startup improvement if you are running on the JVM. Yeah, so we had a lot of back and forth with Gunnar when we were designing this. So yeah, uh, we have it in now. So it'd be great for people to take a look at it, see what's uh, see what they think. Um, so other things, uh, we have an Apache Cassandra client now that joined the Quarkus yeah. platform, which is really interesting. A lot of people were asking for that one. Uh, we have Google and, Cloud Functions. Yeah, on on that. Oh, Many thanks yeah, yeah. for the data stacks. Guy, uh, people oh, yeah. who have actually worked on that and uh, gone through us trying to figure out how extension, external extensions, you know, should be handled in the ecosystem. Uh, hopefully, we're we're having the stuff, you know, well and good now. Uh, they were super open, super responsive. I hope we did the same on on our side. Apparently, uh, you know, everybody was uh, happy. So, go put your data in Cassandra. Nice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, expanding our Quarkus data story for sure. Um, now on the on the functions front, we have Google Cloud Functions now uh, integration, which I think we should uh, thank uh, Loic for because I'm pretty sure, yep. if I remember correctly, he did the the implementation on this. He did all the heavy lifting, so that was that was a great thing to have. So now you have all the three uh, major cloud providers uh, properly supported out of the box in Quarkus, which is great. Uh, what other stuff? Oh, CrawlVM 20.1. So 
So now uh, I think I'm pretty sure we default to Graalvm 20.1 now. Uh, so all the new, new stuff there. I think there's performance improvements as well. Uh, now, slightly different. We have some uh, very important testing uh, feature improvement that a lot of uh, folks from the community were asking for, which is uh, having the ability to run um, different Quarkus applications with different configurations. So like you say, you want like a different... Uh, of different application properties for different runs, you know, test different things. Now we have that in Quarkus. Uh, there's also more improvements that will be part of 1.7, uh, but 1.6 really laid the groundwork there. Is, is that uh, different than the one you showed when you were on? Uh, when I was on, we didn't have this. So when I was on, what I did was uh, that you, you, we were having like only one Quarkus application running for all the tests. So all the stuff that I was configuring, basically, if it was for like one test, but I had configured it the way I had set up the different tests. Um, I was leveraging facts that like, uh, okay, everything was going through, let's say the same um, power, uh, sorry, um, mock HTTP server, and it was like proxying and stuff like that. So everything worked um, for the way I had set it up. Yeah. But now what you can do is you don't have to worry about it that much. You can just use like a one uh, annotation and you can change different properties and you can uh, uh, change CDI beans and stuff like that. So that's really, that's really great. All right. yeah. So the, so the same thing, just more controlled. Yeah, under yeah, the cover we, we detect, oh, you're using a different profile. So we will stop the Quarkus of the previous profile, start the Quarkus of the new profile and continue with your tests. Exactly, that's um, exactly yeah. what it is, so, yeah. All right, awesome. uh, let's not eat too much time on the, the big mm -hmm. subject of today, though. And uh, with that, uh, there's Gunnar here that will, you know, hey tell us all about, every, all about that. But who are you first? <laughs> who are you? <laughs> what are you, are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. <Stop. laughs> um, yes, isn't this a new thing, like a uh, Skype call bumping or whatever it's called? <laughs> I'm just... I'm just <laughs> Of them. Uh, yeah, so I work on Debezium. I'm a Red Hat, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, and um, so Debezium, that's the project I'm going to talk about today. Um, it's a tool for change data capture, and we will explain what this means and what it can do for you and why I think it would be helpful for you. Um, I've been involved with a few other things at Red Hat. I've been working on Hibernate for some time, or different Hibernate projects. I've been the spec lead for Bean Validation 2.0, and I'm also a little bit involved with um, Quarkus. So I work on the Kafka stream extension. So maybe I can even come back and uh, you would have me for another session about Kafka strings and Quarkus. Cool. Yes, indeed. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and people, please put comments on the, I mean, you know, tell us what you think while we do this live. If you have questions, please, uh, you know, send it out. Oh, there, there you go. There's a t-shirt. Uh, Antonio was asking whether, why nobody had a, you know, Quarkus t-shirt. Oh, but there you go. Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, uh, and Max will, you know, show up the yeah, exactly the the comments on the on the live stream. Uh, okay, so so first of all, I think the the context of what we're going to discuss around is uh, discuss today is around event driven architecture, which is essentially instead of having a you know essentially a HTTP front end that will just go and answer your questions. Ideally, you would have rather events that will be generated and listened to and it's a, essentially a river of events going on so why is it important nowadays uh Gunnar? yeah so the way i see it it's really about uh you know creating independence between teams uh, allowing different things to be uh, scaled in different ways i mean it's a little bit like microservices themselves and i would say events it really allows you to have a loose coupling let's say between components right the one system must not be available or running when the sending system produces an event it can consume this event whenever it um, pleases to so you have this independence um, you can do things like replaying events i think that's a great opportunity so let's say you keep a track of your events and you bring up some new system and you just get to replay all those events from the beginning. And I mean, there's some technical, technical complexities around it, but then it allows it to you know, go back in time, see how did the state of the data look before, and maybe bring up some new business logic reprocessing this data. So I think there's really many, many good things about those event-driven approaches. Cool. Um, and uh, people are feel free to you know, uh, show up and ask questions, but otherwise there is this, uh, so as a way to implement even driven architecture, there is a, a skew of options. Um, right. And 
I would say the purest model uh, proposed by some is this notion of even sourcing, right? Which is, uh, uh, you know, in in a nutshell, just saying the source of truth is this uh, a queue of events that I that I can replay from zero, so I can reconstitute my state. So you don't store the latest version of the state like a database would, but you store every change that you're making and you replay them to have the state, right? And I don't know what's your perspective, but that's that's definitely the purest form, it feels to me. Uh, but that's, of course, hard to achieve. Right. And also, it's um, it comes with many challenges, I would say, right? So just think about doing things like enforcing uniqueness. Uh, you want to have like just a single customer with a given e email address. Um, so, it, and, so this means essentially you need to take a look at the current state and just make sure uh, that no other customer exists with this email address. And in a database, well, you just would put a unique constraint on your column and you would be done. In a transaction. <laughs> And what it would be even what, done in a transaction. <laughs> it could be rolled back, right? And now if you just keep those events and it's just like your append only locked, it means you have to do more work for those kinds of things. So I feel sometimes people struggle with those um, pure approaches, let's say, and it's, it's, it's quite tricky. So I think it's a great tool to have in the box, but I would uh, definitely not default to using this kind of architecture. I just would consciously use it and um, make use of it for specific cases, I guess. Okay. So is it like a, a historic, like, let's say, artifact or something that is like the first architecture out there that uses events or and, and now like you wouldn't use it because we have better options like CBC? Um, well, I would really say it's different, you know, different approaches for different use cases. I would say, um, I mean, just going to a database and just being able to see the current state of the data, that's also very valuable, right? So you don't need to think about getting this projection of and, and compaction of all my events. I just go to my current state. So that's also a good good asset. Um, so really, let's say I would probably use this kind of event sourced approach if I really, you know, for specific entities in my architecture, let's say, where I will need to keep this history and where I will really benefit from maybe being able to reprocess those events and um, produce a different shape um, in a materialized view. But then in other cases, I might not even need this, I think. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a parallel question to, you know, why are you doing microservices right, versus some monolith? Right. Uh, the reason you're doing it, despite the uh, expensive proposition, because there's lots of moving target, is the agility and the uh, yeah, ability to shift to new approaches and not have to pay a super high cost each time you do it for a piece of your of the area you're building. So even sourcing is really uh, giving you that freedom, but of course it comes at a cost because you have to deal with those changes and probably have a persistent version of that in one database of sorts to make life a bit easier for the application. So it's a bit more complex to think of, reason about, and then a bit of a moving target. So. Right. So, so with the events like this is Kafka, and I saw the and Antonio was talking about JMS. So, why and where? Like, where is Debian in this spectrum? Like, Debian is a very specific so, thing, right? So hold on. So JMS is really an API, right? Mm -hmm. Events are like the payload, and Kafka is the broker doing things. JMS is just an API that can talk to whatever uh, in. In Quarkus, we, I think, support the JMS API uh, for Cupid, for example, but uh, the API we tend to promote is more uh, uh, reactive messaging, uh, micro-profile reactive messaging, which to us feels more like JMS 3, right? It's the future of JMS, uh, so in, uh, done in a more modern fashion, but it's all about consuming events and then you know, producing events and, and, and doing it well. Right. I mean, so as you ask about Kafka, so really, this is essentially like a messaging fabric, I would say, which is very, very commonly used, um, especially in microservices architectures. And it comes with some interesting characteristics, which you wouldn't find in your classical JMS broker, right? So you can um, essentially scale out horizontally at libitum. You can do things like just going back to the beginning of your topic and reprocess those kinds of things. Um, you have specific ordering semantics. Um, so, and I think that's all why this is super popular and um, very interesting for many use cases. Yeah, it leaks some implementation details, but then it gives you, if you took them as your fundamental semantic, then it gives you lots of freedom. Right. 
Right. So Tuning to has to do change data capture, right? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right. So and then I ask, I must, Max was asking, so how does Debezium fit in there? And yeah. I mean, so having something like Kafka by itself, it's um, you know not so useful, right? You need something to get data into it, and you need to get, get data out of it, um, so you can, can actually make use of the nice thing that Kafka is. And this is where Debezium comes into play. So essentially. Uh, what it does is it puts change events out of your database into Kafka. So this means whenever something in your database changes, like a new customer gets created, purchase order gets updated, or something gets deleted, it will Debezium will capture this event from the transaction log of the database, and it will send a change event with, which describes this change to uh, to Apache Kafka. So you would have um, topics in Kafka with your order, order changes, with your customer changes, and so on. And then, well, you could set up any kinds of consumers which could subscribe to those topics, and they could react to those changes. And it's, uh, this allows a user to do all sorts of of interesting things like they could just replicate the data and you know duplicate it into another database. They could you could use the data and feed a search index, or you could update your cache. I mean that's always a common problem, right? So how do you keep your cache in sync if your database values have changed? And that's something you could do with Debezium. But then you also could do things like streaming queries. So let's say you would like to iter iteratively run a query as your data changes and you would like to just keep, you know, let's say the total value of your purchase orders as a current constantly updated value. That's something you could do with Kafka streams, for instance, and Debezium would feed such a Kafka streams application. So analytics is like a, a really important use case. Uh, CDC, it's definitely, right? It is a use case, right? So doing those um, streaming queries and um, gaining insight into your data as it changes. So that's definitely we see uh, something we see in the Debezium community. People do. Uh, so, so just me, to me being a noob here. So basically, you're saying Debezium is like connecting your good old data database like Postgres, MySQL, Oracle to the event-based world. Exactly right. So it's, it's exactly right. So the way it works is it taps into the transaction log of the database. I mean, all the databases they work essentially like this. They have like an append only transaction log um, where all the writes essentially are added to, and then the actual table files they are derived from then, right? And the Bezium taps into tra into the transaction log, and then it gets all the changes which all the transactions which have been executed essentially, and. <clears throat> We can capture those and send them to to Kafka, and this also means, or this explains the conceptual difference to something like event sourcing. So, whereas in event sourcing, you would really persist like your actual business events and maybe their intent, the intent which is associated to that. Whereas here, we capture change events from uh, records in database tables, right? So there's a different semantics to that, which is important to keep in mind. Oh, uh, there's a question about uh, Maria to be, uh, what kind of database <laughs> does it support? Right, so this, that's a good one. I mean, so that's exactly the, uh, one of the challenges. So there's just no one API which we could use and then we would be able to implement change data capture for all the databases. Instead, it means we need to explore how do we do this for MySQL and get changes out of the bin log? How do we do this for Postgres so we get changes from the wall? How do we do it for MongoDB and so on? So we have different databases which we support. Um, MariaDB, it's not something which we officially support yet. What I do know is people from the community, they use the MySQL connector. I mean, they are related, right? So people use the MySQL connector successfully with MariaDB. There are some cases where this doesn't work. So let's say they did uh, some changes to the DDL. So you can you have more flexible DDL options in MariaDB. And we are not supporting all of them. Or maybe there are some kinds of events or event types in the log of MariaDB which we cannot support yet. So that's something we currently look into, and hopefully we have also a more authoritative answer for MariaDB at some point. Okay, very cool. So, <clears throat> how does Division fit into this whole uh, C to C? Now Emmanuel disappeared. <laughs> Do uh, keep calling. Yeah. yeah. I mean, right, so Debezium essentially is an implementation of CDC, right? So change data capture, that's really the, uh, the general pattern, going to a database, capture changes out of it, and Debezium is a open source implementation of this particular um, pattern. That's, that's the connection. Okay, maybe you want to demo something, make it a bit more concrete? or have Exactly, to... right. So what I wanted to demo is, so can people see my screen uh, with my slide there? Now they can, all right, excellent. Yeah. 
Right, so what I wanted to show is a particular use case of DBSM and CDC, and this is called uh, the outbox pattern. And the use case there is you have, well, you have your microservices, and if you design them properly, they should not share any databases or any persistent store, right? Each of them should have their own, uh, its own database. But then still, those services, they don't exist in isolation, right? They need to exchange uh, some data. So let's say I have an order service, and then this receives uh, requests uh, for new purchase orders. And then definitely something like a shipment service needs to be notified somehow. Um, so it would be able to build shipments and send them out to the customer. Or maybe you have a customer service and there you need to keep the credit score of the customer and, and, and whatnot. So those services, they, uh, they need to exchange data, right? And now this comes back to Emmanuel's original question. We don't really should use APIs here because we would have this kind of synchronous uh, coupling, right? So, and then if the shipment service isn't available, well, the order service couldn't do it thing, so that would be a problem. So we go for events. Um, we, um, so we have those services loosely coupled. Um, but then there's a, a subtle problem, and this is uh, what is called dual rights. So typically, if people start with this kind of architecture, what they would like to do is, if they implement this auto service, they would go to their database and purchase this, uh, purchase, per persist, this new purchase order in the database. And then at the same time, they would like to go and send an event to uh, the shipment service, maybe using Apache Kafka. And now the problem is, we don't have any transactional guarantees here. There's no thing, no such thing like distributed transactions, which would span around a database transaction and a change in Kafka. So this means if you just go and do those two updates to your database and Kafka, um, you're just uh, prone to inconsistencies at some point. It might happen, your transaction in the database, it commits, but then the write to Kafka fails or the other way around and you end up with inconsistent data. So maybe you did not get to purchase the to, um, persist the order in your database, but then you already sent a message to the shipment service and it, off it goes and builds the shipment, right? So that's not something you question. want. Question, is it, uh, so in the good old JMS, uh, yes. XA world. Is that a problem they solve because you send everything in within a transaction, the message and the change to your database or not quite? Yes. Right. No, it would it would be have been solved there, right? Because you would I mean if you set up things correctly, because then you would have a shared transaction around your GMS broker and uh, your database. Um so you could uh, you would have had those guarantees essentially. But then also it, it um I, I, it comes back to this availability concern, right? So now your application, it needs to be able to write to the database and to the JMS broker. So um, that, that's not ideal. And there, there, I mean, there's complexities around it. So that's why this fell a little bit out of favor, I would say. Okay. There was one question, by the way, on Divisium proper, which is, are there any plans for Divisium to also support on Cascade Delete for MySQL? <laughs> so I suppose this person was on the chat or on the Jira tracker last week because we had this question last week. Um, okay. so the problem with Cascade Deletes is they don't uh, reflect in the transaction log, so we don't have a good way to find out about what rows you know, are affected by the Cascade. So that's, that's the problem there. Wow. So is that... Is it the only operation that is not reflected into the transaction log? So truncate, uh, I mean, that's also is a problem, right? If you truncate an entire table, we would have to materialize a delete event for all the records, which is something which we cannot easily do. I think those are the two, two. problems in this kind of category. Uh, but I have the a question. Cascade delete is really the MySQL, maybe Maya. It's yeah, right. Problem. So I'm, I, exactly. So this is really, uh, I would say, an implementation detail of. Uh, I mean, it might work with Postgres. I'm not sure, um, but definitely, I'm aware it's a problem in my in Maria or my SQL, and we, yeah, we don't really have a, uh, an answer to that one. So I have a, like a um, really, if you know the answer, like real quick, if That's truncate it. isn't um, replicated in a log. How do how do how does database like replication work? Oh no! So there is a truncate event. Um, but, so but this really just essentially says this table is gone, right? Oh, okay, okay, I got gotcha, you. Gotcha. The consumer it won't know which. Um, okay, yeah, I see, I see. Is. That's that's okay. important. Gotcha. Thanks. So ideally, they fix it on the. Maya or the Maya yeah, side. I mean, mean there's <laughs> reasons why they do it. Um, so. Yeah, I'm not sure they, this is going to change, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. All right. I'll All right. So, then. 
Artbox, exactly. So we have, so we can't do this, do these dual writes because we end up with potentially with inconsistent data, and that's a problem. And the question is, what should we else do? And this is uh, one suggestion. And this is, well, if you cannot update your database and Kafka at the same time, what you always can do is you can just update your database, right? So the idea there is, well, this order service, it goes and it updates this table with purchase orders. And then at the same time, it also produces an insert into another table, the Outbox table, which really is a message. So the contents of those of this Outbox table, those are events which are meant to be sent to other services. So you have, uh, and this happens within one local transaction, right? That's why this is safe to be done. And if you would um, roll back this transaction, we would not neither have the order nor the event in the Outbox table. So that's a safe thing to do. And then the museum comes into play and it will capture the events from the Outbox table and send them to different topics in Kafka. And we will see in the demo how this works. And also, um, this is now why I'm here actually today, because if we build this kind of um, architecture with um, uh, Quarkus, there's a Quarkus extension for implementing the Outbox pattern with um, Debezium, and that's that's what I'm going to show today. So just to give one example or and one idea how this event table could look like. So you see it there on the on the chart. So essentially, we have there different types of events, and it's a bit based on the uh, nomenclature from the domain driven design. So we speak about aggregate types, so um, like order or customer. Um, there's an aggregate ID, so this describes the um, actual the, the root aggregate and its ID of, of a specific change, and this allows them to route those changes to different topics and also keep the or the events which pertain to the same aggregate, to the same customer, to the same order in their correct order. And the payload, well, that's any kind of event structure we would like to use. So typically people use JSON, but you, it could be Avro. I know some people use Avro. And essentially what kind of event structure we would like to have. Okay, that's the idea. You, so you said what? I, the, I just want to, well, they used Avro? What was the, the Avro. 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 Exactly. It's so, another, ah, Avro. Okay, uh, got it. Generalization. Okay. Okay. Exactly. So some people do that. All right. So let me get started. And um, by the way, the advantage of Avro is, uh, yeah, well, it's smaller. Uh, it's got a schema, and uh, you can check for backward compatibility when you change the schema, which is a big plus compared to JSON, which is text big and no schema. Exactly. Right. So um, I'm starting up all the things. This will take me a second. So I uh, use uh, make your. Post. Your locally. Your command line bigger. Let's. Okay, absolutely. We'll do nice, that sir. in a second. Um, but first of all, let's take a look at the things I'm I'm uh, having in my demo. So I have this order service. Um, so this is just a simple Quarkus service for per uh, persisting orders. I have this shipment service. So that's the one which should be notified about uh, incoming um, purchase orders. There's two d databases. So it's microservices. They should have their own databases, right? And then I have um, Kafka. So that's my messaging fabric um, I'm going to use to um, convey my changes. And I have a Kafka Connect. And actually, I did not speak about Kafka Connect yet. And that's a framework and also a runtime for connectors like Debezium. So Debezium gets deployed into Kafka Connect. And then this one will uh, essentially you know, take the changes from the database and send them to Apache Kafka. So that's, that's Kafka Connect. All right, so let's see. Um, so how about that? Is, should it still be bigger, or is this, is this good? I still see your. Uh, hold on. I'm confused with the. Uh, I'm seeing terminals. Yeah, terminals. Sorry. Exactly right. So let's see. Um, Quarkus dev mode. So what I'm first of all doing. So I have already started with. Uh, you know, I don't want to start from scratch here. So and I have this um, auto service there, and I'm starting it. Or I'm launching it in the Quarkus dev mode, which I think you all know, and this allows me to apply changes. Um, as we go. Okay, so let me start that one. And let me also go to my IDE. And this is um, my um, my two services here. So I have this order service and I have this shipment service. So let's take a look first at the order service, order service. And what I do have here is it's a very basic thing, really. So it's just a application scoped CDI being I inject the entity manager. So I'm not using the Hibernate Panache stuff yet. I'm a bit old school, so that I'm using the entity manager. And yeah, really, there is no technical reason you you don't, right? No, or exactly. The, the reason is I built this demo some time ago, and then I think Panache wasn't a thing yet. Um, nowadays, I would probably use it. 
exactly. And then I just have two methods really here, one for receiving a new purchase order and another one for updating an order line, just for the sake of example. And then there's a REST facade, so we can take a quick look at that one too. I have this order resource, and this really just delegates essentially to my service, okay? So that's what I have here. So let me actually first try and see whether I can, um, whether that works. So let me post something there. And I have prepared a few requests. So I have a create order request. Um, it's really just some, some simple data there. I get back some response, so that's good. Um, I have persisted a new order with two um, order lines. And I also can take a look into my database. So you have written two books already? What's that? Uh, yeah, it's division in action and division for dummies. Um, you know, we got to cover the whole market. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so movies for dummies. Also. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. So let me log in. PG admin. By the way, I really recommend that one. That's a very nice UI, so I don't need to fiddle with the CLI to see what's going on in my database. And now I can take a look into my order database. And I should see my purchase order. So let's take a look there. Uh, query tool. And same start from purchase order. There you go. And this is my purchase order. And there's also another table with all the lines. Um, that's not so important. But just so just to see it works, I'm going to do another purchase. And then if I run this one again, okay, so I, now I see two purchase orders. Okay, so that's that's all nice and dandy, so that works. Now let's see how we can actually go and implement this notification of the shipment service about those um, purchase orders, okay? And what I'm going to do first is I add this extension. So I'm using this um, uh, add extension goal from Crocus, and this is part of the catalog. So actually, I can also go to crocus.io and go to the code stuff there. And um, there's also our Outbox extension. So you could, even if you started with a new project from scratch, um, let me just see whether it's there. I can add this uh, this Outbox stuff, OK? So this is part of the Quokus uh, universe. I think that's what you call it, right? So you have this ecosystem of extensions, and the Bison is, is part of that. OK. So I have that there, it, it has been added. So let me go back to my project. And now if I go to my POM, I should see this extension there. And it, it's here, and I'm just going to update this. So the last time this was added to the universe or to the platform, this was still beta 2. I'm, I'm going to use the final here. So let me do this. And now, well, I, I need to do some sort of implementation. And first of all, I need to define my event, uh, which I would like to set. So I'm creating a new class for that. So hold on, it's a bit weird that you require a version here. Isn't it driven by the, the bomb, the platform bomb? Uh, yes, it is. Um, and and it's, I'm just overriding it because it's okay. still not the latest one in the, in the platform. Because we, we want the latest and greatest, obviously. Exactly right. So I don't want to, you know, bother people with a beta here. So that's why I updated okay. it. It would work with the other. But so is it in one point six or not yet? Then uh, I'm. I think it is, but I'm not sure. I would have to check with Chris. I'll check for all yeah. people. Just, just go for it. All right. So and I'm going to implement this type um, exported event, and this is defined by this extension, and it has two type parameters for the key and for the value. And in this case, I'm using so that's the ID type, that's string, and then the payload of the event, that's, um, in my case, I'm just using JSON node here, so I just would like to use a generic JSON structure. Then we need to implement a few methods there. So let me do this, aggregate ID, just coming to this later on. So actually, aggregate type, I know this, so this will be order, so all of those events of this type, they represent um, order events. And then the type, that's like a subtype within this category. So I have something like order created, for instance, and that could be my maybe like um, order line updated. Just, just to correct, what type system of types are we talking here? Is that Java, is this Kafka or the Visium? Where, where, so what, this what really I? is essentially, it's up to you. So what it, uh, uh, in Kafka messages, they are really just byte 
uh, arrays. So uh, messages, do, they do have a key, and this key in our case, that's the aggregate ID, so the order ID or the customer ID. And this has a specific meaning because it means all the events which pertain to the same ID or to the same message key, they will be kept in order. So this means if you have multiple changes to the same purchase order, they will be, you know, the order will, will be guaranteed to a consumer. And the, the value, that's just any byte array. And for our purposes, we just use a JSON structure here, which describes, um, well, this event that an order has been created. But you bring up a very important point because this kind of is an API, right? So if you change the event, Definition and maybe you you know you add properties okay that's fine but you shouldn't easily remove stuff or rename stuff in those event structures because then it could impact consumers so that's a contract you have with the consumer there so I guess it gets okay. a bit more clear as I implement this so let me see but but it's really up to you to put whatever you want in in those essentially especially the payload here exactly right, right. and we will we will see that so I'm creating fields for that aggregate ID. Um, so uh, by the way, Max, I'm looking at the Quarkus platform yield. project, and I see there is a division property which defines the version, but I don't find the source of that property. So, so. Uh oh, that doesn't sound good. Oh. So, let's see. And now I actually need to take my purchase order and convert it into this JSON because this is a little bit too much to type. I already have prepared this and I'm just going to paste this in. I found it. So yeah, 1.6 has 1.2.0 final for the division out box. All right. Uh, okay. Here I'm still on 1.5 something. Um, so that, that's the same. Guys, it's, it's so old. Like it's been a week. We didn't have new platform <laughs> updating. That's, that's the reason. All right, so let's see what is happening here. So I'm just essentially having some JSON, you know, Jackson code, which takes the purchase order and produces this event order created from it. Okay, so I need to still create an object mapper there. Private um, object mapper, just for the sake, I mean, probably would implement it a bit differently, but really just for the sake of the example. Um, so here, just to put some perspective compared to what we said before, I keep keep going. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. here you start to the database the old way, but you also create an event source, the new way. And that event source will be stored in this technical table, which is the, I forgot how you called it, the outbox table. Exactly right. So let's see what's missing here. I need to still convert this into a string. All right, so there we go. So I mean, uh, getting implementing this event, this might be a bit of uh, you know busy work, but you only do this once essentially. So let's see what's still missing there. And so now, Jason, oh, I created. Why don't you know that one? Oh, I renamed it. See, I had shows a different name originally. Okay, so that's my event type. So now I actually need to produce this event. So I'm going to my purchase order service again. And here in this case, so now I would like to emit this event. And I'm using the CDI events for this. So I don't need to concern myself with, with, with persisting this in a database. So what I'm doing is I inject this event producer here, event, um, and it should be an exported event. And this one is the CDI uh, mechanism of firing events, right? So what I do here is just say fire, and in my case, I say create order event, which represents my new purchase order. There you go. And now very important to understand this, this event gets, oh, sorry, one second. To put that out. By the way, you don't have to use uh, JPA, I guess. You can use any persistence technology. All right, uh, so currently the extension, uh, I think it uses JPA, but uh, maybe it's even low-level SQL. Um, so definitely that's the implementation detail, right? And we could improve okay. this extension, but that's exactly why we talk about CDI events here. So as a user of this extension, you just concern yourself with, with persisting this, um, or with producing this CDI event, right? And just the extension, that's the important part. It takes care of persisting this event into this outbox table in the same transaction as we store this actual purchase order here. So now let's see, uh, I hope the live coding mode, so um, picked all those changes up. So let me see, and I'm producing another 
purchase order there and it should trigger a reload. Okay. And now let's see what's in the database. And I should still see my um, purchase order. So, I mean, the Quarkus drops everything which is in the database, so that's why we just see one record here, okay? Um, so I see that one, and now I should also see something in this outbox table. And indeed I do, so now this is my JSON payload here. Ah, oh, come on, can I do this? I do that. So this is the JSON I've produced, so this describes the entire purchase order and uh, all these order lines, and I have all those other things like the aggregate type, order, I have this event type, order created, I have a timestamp, and I have this aggregate ID. So this is nice, and uh, let's just do one more, and then I should again see uh, another um, outbox event for now for a different purchase order. Okay, so that's that's great. And just for the sake of the example, I have prepared two more events, and I will just um, paste them in, so um, don't need to type all this again. So I have another event type, which uh, describes the update of an order line item. And then I have one more, and this describes the creation of an invoice. So let me also paste those in. Oh. Well, you do that, so uh, I'm trying to stack the, the, the concepts here. So right. change data capture is the concept where you listen to a database change and uh, you transform them into events that you put in your queue, okay? So the queue could be Kafka, and the BZM could be your change data capture event, and say uh, SQL, uh, MySQL could be your, your database. Right. Here, what uh, Guna shows is a pattern that you will uh, use CDC with to uh, enhance that, right? So it's, so it's not, you don't have to do that to listen to a database change with Divisium and, and do something. But here, you can bring higher level information, uh, which is as business values into the payload that would be more meaningful to, uh, to you as a, as, well, for the application, right? Instead of just the technical detail that an order has been changed in the database. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, um, so why I said that? So I, I create those two more event types, and I'm also firing them, right? So when I receive a purchase order, I also produce this invoice created event, and then if I update an order line, then I fire a order line update event. So let me produce another purchase order. So again, the live reload triggers, and then I also have this cancel uh, option, so I will cancel an order line. And now if I go to my outbox table, I should see those um, three events. So I have for my purchase order one, I see this order created event, I see this order line updated event, which describes this cancellation of one order, per order line, and I have this invoice created event, which pertains to this customer of this order. So, all this, uh, really, Divisium itself uh, didn't play any role of this yet, right? So we just have our microservice. It changes its state, or it uh, changes its persistent state by updating or persisting new purchase orders. And at the same time, it produces those events into this outbox table. But no one is yet uh, listening to those, right? So that's what I need to do next. I need to actually capture the inserts from this table and send them to Kafka. Uh, this, before, before you yeah. do that, I have, I have a question. OK, so you, you mentioned earlier that there was a contract between like the consumer that you're going to write now yeah. and the producer you just created. Right. Um, what's the strategy? Like, is, is there like a strategy that we define a schema? Or uh, what, what's the thing you usually yeah. see? Or do I just people just like create JSON and hope for the best? Yeah. Crossing fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so there's uh, this thing, Whistle and Soap. Uh, no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> so definitely you should think about a schema. So you have options for describing the schema of a, a JSON structure. Then also this is um, where Avro comes in, right? Because we have uh, uh, Avro messages. They have strong um, um, schemas. And also it's where this notion of a schema registry comes into play. So people often deploy those alongside those architectures and then this schema registry, it will keep track of the schemas, their versions, um, and then messages themselves. They will also have a, a reference to this schema in the registry and a user 
or a consumer could go to the registry and interpret um, the schema of this uh, message. So, I mean, just speaking about JSON, its type system is really limited, right? So if you look mm -hmm. at something like a numbers, you don't know is this like a long or an int. Whereas if yeah. you have a schema for that, then you can make sense out of that, right? So that's definitely a good thing to do. Okay, gotcha, thanks. All right, so let me deploy the Debezium connector. So Kafka Connect, I started this already. I started well, John go, go. Paul is to make Gunnar fail into making the demo within the hour. Yeah, I think. So, and I'll do my attempt here. So, uh, Sandra actually asked, like, why is the creation of the entity using merge? Oh, gee, uh, that's a very good question. So, I mean, I have transitioned off the Hibernate team like, like years ago. Say, Maniel, you know that. Why do you prefer merge over? I think it's, it's just, you know, for the sake of some. You, sh you shouldn't. You should really use persist in this case because you know that it's a net new order and it will be more efficient. Merge has uh, some specific semantic where it will try to fetch the data from the database yeah. and then apply the changes and then push them back in. Uh, there, there is actually an open issue inside the Quarkus <laughs> uh, uh, repo, uh, repo where we figured out that, you know, um, especially with Panache, we realized that there is a JPA uh, a method that is essentially missing, and we will need to invent it with the right semantic and push it back to the JPA okay. consortium. Oh, we I haven't see, done see. that yet. Wow. Okay. That's why Sane has been picky. Uh, Mails would work in this case. Uh, oh, Sane did even ask the, oh, no. the extra, yes, the oh, extra really? select oh. <laughs> uh, is probably not a problem in practice because we would know that the ID is uh, null and it's yeah. a generated ID, so we, are, we have an optimization, I think. Okay, yeah, so. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no <laughs> that's pressure. A, that's, a, that's a nice one. I see. People are really no very, very no uh, into the details. All right. So I have registered the Debezium connector. And the way I'm doing this, so I have Kafka Connect running, and I post, or in this case, I put this uh, configuration there. And the way it works is, so I say, I would like to deploy an instance of the Debezium post the connector. What's that? Oh, uh, Max. I was talking, yeah. You see, I'm you learning a lot of buttons. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's all good now. No worries, all right. it's just uh, Max and I. So I deploy this instance of the Debezium Postgres connector. I say, you know, I give the information like that's the host name, that's the credentials, port, and so on. I'm just interested in this particular table, outbox event, so I'm not interested in any other table. And then I have uh, what is like a little bit the icing on the on the cake? I have this transformation here. So in Kafka Connect, I have can I can have transformations which modify a message before it gets sent into Kafka. And in this case, I'm using this event router transformation, which comes from the Debezium project. And this really takes care of routing the event uh, into the right topic, for instance. So by default, the thing is uh, with uh, Debezium, I would have one topic for all the events which pertain or which originate from one of the same table. So I would end up with, with uh, one huge topic for my outbox events table. Whereas really, I would like to have different topics for my other events, for my customer events, and so on. And the outbox router, this is taking care of this. And so I don't, I won't go into the details of all the configuration, but what we can do is we can take a look into the Kafka topic there. And I'm using this very nice tool, Kafka Cat. For that one. Um, so, Gunnar, just the, the configuration you have on the upper right, That's you just do that once and then you can add any any amount of outbox tables to it or outbox events. Exactly right. So, this yeah. okay. registers the connector, and now if new outbox events are created, um, the connector will pick them up from this table and send them to Kafka. So, you will see that. So, let me use Kafka Cat and uh, we will take a look into this topic here. So, that's my other events. And now you know, I, I hope things uh, get apparent how they fall together. So my message key in Kafka, so that's my aggregate ID. So all the changes, all the events for the purchase order one, they will have the same key. I have some more things like this event type. So that's a Kafka header property. I have an ID uh, that's a unique ID, which a consumer can use to duplicate events in case it sees an event a second time. And then the actual value of the event the, that's that's my JSON payloads. It's it's a escape form here, but really that's that's the actual event payload, right? So that's my cancellation there, um, and that's that's my initial order creation. So and now Max, as you were asking, so I'm tailing this topic here, right? So let me uh, persist another order. 
create order and then we see now I see this uh, next order coming in here right with ID 2 so this is um, tailing the change or tracking the changes uh, from this from this table and sending them to to consumers and now what I could do is but I suppose we probably should uh, um, wrap up the demo so I, in my shipment servers I can go and subscribe to this topic. And actually, I will just very quickly show it to you so you see how it's done, because it's really simple. So I have this um, Kafka event consumer here. So this really is using the, uh, this very nice API from MicroProfile, which is called Reactive Messaging. And it allows me to interact with Kafka and other messaging um, systems very easily, very intuitively. So here I'm just uh, declaring an application scope being Kafka event consumer, and I'm subscribed to this logical topic, which is named, or channel, I should say, orders. And now if I go to my configuration, this one is actually bound to this order events topic. So whenever the order service produced a new event to this topic, uh, my shipment service will see it. And now what it can do is it can, you know, uh, uh, trigger its business logic, persist or create a shipment and do all those uh, kinds of things. So essentially, um, so yeah, I, I, let me let me do that as one last thing really. So let me go to my shipment database. So just to believe me, it works. And there I should see a shipment. Let's see, shipment database. <clears throat> shipment and there you go so for all my purchase orders I have a shipment there right so let me just produce another one um, so the BSM picks it up from the outbox table sends it to Kafka the shipment service is subscribed uh, to this Kafka topic and whenever this event arrives it will um, produce another shipment in my case, right? So that's really the idea. And now I have this kind of loose coupling between those services. And the nice thing is, well, if my shipment service isn't available, this doesn't impact my order service, right? So really, uh, the order service just needs to write to its database and everything else will happen asynchronously after that. So this will eventually uh, keep up if something is done for a while. And again, it, it feels the it fills the gap like if you have a legacy applications that talks to a legacy database and you want to listen to that to transform them as events you will use cd plain cdc but if you if you want to add in the application more uh, uh, business higher level meaning to the right. messages that's where the outbox pattern is really great exactly uh because uh, you don't expose and, and also the internal this structure right. of your database, right? So, I mean, we could yeah. have, of course, we could have subscribed to the changes in the purchase order table itself, but then we really would expose this internal model, the column types and everything, we would expose this to consumers, and we would be free to change it. Whereas here, if we have this outbox pattern, um, this really uh, uh, is an abstraction, right? So we can now evolve the model of the, our order service independently from all those consumers because we can keep a stable external contract. Well, it's really cool. Like, like that was a good, good understanding or a good demo of it. So right. Good. By the way, the so, demo is available on GitHub. Somebody was asking. Exactly right. So we we do have under the Debezium org on GitHub. We have Debezium dash examples. That's our repo with all sorts of DBs examples, and there's one uh, for the for the outbox pattern. Um, yeah. Maybe one thing to mention is this all has um, at least once semantics, right? So this means consumers they always must be prepared to see a specific event a second time. This could happen if something crashes in the meantime, and then it could uh, the shipment service could see a um, particular event a second time, and this is why. We have this unique um, event ID there. So what the shipment service can do in this implementation is doing it. It's, it's keeping track of the events which it already has seen. And then in case it receives a duplicate, it just can discard this one and don't, let's say, produce a second shipment for the same purchase order. And is that so what does it, oh, sorry. how does it know about that? Oh, because it's in the database, you will... Have exactly. So ID. I have the uh, I have this uh, um, unique ID as a header property here. Mm -hmm. And what my shipment service is doing is it keeps track of everything in another table of consumed message there. And here I just really, you know, have the ID there as a primary key. 
and then I just do a quick look up, and if I see it again, then I will just ignore it. If you're doing analytics, uh, bulk analytics, you don't really care t too much about those rare events, and you wouldn't check that. But if it's uh, triggering some shipments or business right, right. things, then you would do this. Okay. Exactly. And I mean, usually you won't see duplicates this way if something fails, right? So let's say Kafka Connect crashes or Divisum crashes, um, then then this uh, could happen. Usually you would not see this. And if I'm if um if I remember correctly, uh, Kafka Streams takes care of this automatically, right? Doesn't it? Well, yes, you can have exactly one semantics with Kafka mm -hmm. streams. Uh, there's some things to consider around it, but yes, then essentially it will do this for you and it will avoid reprocessing a specific record which it already had processed before. That's okay, right. Yeah. So yeah, I think we need some other time. We need you to do the Kafka streams demo. Oh well. yeah, absolutely. That would, would, would be my pleasure because that has a really nice as a portfolio live coding feature, for instance. So that's mm -hmm. really cool. All right, so we gotta, we're going to get close to the hour, but we've got a few questions in here. There was one from uh, Naranya, Narayan. He says, I wonder if app incoming also works for the Lambda function in serverless architecture. Whoa. So that, that is, you didn't have incoming. That's not for us. No, no, I do have, we but should... I'm, I'm not quite sure what the, what he refers to with, with the Lambda. So, yeah, so, um, oh, you mean Lambda architecture as in... Um, a live processing, or you mean Amazon Lambda? So, yeah, go and answer that, and let's go to the next question in the meantime. Yeah, then the other, <coughs> that one was the testing. Where was it? Uh, no, that's probably Lambda, Lambda as in Amazon Lambda, because it's a serverless architecture function, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. So, I actually have been advocating for that, for what you said, um, um, Narayan, uh, because I felt any Lambda is essentially consuming an event and processing it and yeah. pushing it out. Uh, people that had more time than me to think about it, like, you know, Bill and I think Clement a tiny bit, they decided not to go for that. So our main, like, standard APIs is, is essentially HTTP. So you receive an HTTP request and then you process that and that's how you process an event. And then there is Funky, which... Uh, has this different abstraction, but they don't use at incoming. We probably should get Bill on uh, one of those calls and try to have a conversation around Lambda and then have that, that question yeah. or serverless in, in general. It would make sense. I think you can connect a Lambda to AKS and um, it would be an interesting model, definitely. Uh, you mean, a yes, but uh, Amazon does abstract uh, the event yeah. for you. Oh, ah, okay. I see. Yeah, maybe so. Here, here is he's yeah. saying, um, I, inside my Quarkus app, I want to react to a function as if it was an event incoming yeah. at incoming, which to me was making sense at first sight. Uh, yeah. Maybe we can revisit that with some more conversations. And then the other one was just we talked about testing or verifying the. the what's it called? The validity, like you had this contract between the. Uh -huh the payload on the outgoing and incoming. And there's just someone saying that you can use consumer driven contract testing. So I'm not sure how that would apply because these two servers are kind of separate. But I guess you would just have API, well, you have a contract and you just test on both sides. I think that's what he refers to. Yeah, yeah. I think what they mean, or what what really what they meant is uh, so the shipment team, the team which builds the shipment service, they could uh, you know create a test based on their understanding of this contract. They would give it to the other team, and the other team would run it as part of their um, yeah, CI exactly. suite, right? And now if they were to change the contract somehow, uh, maybe unconsciously, then this test would fail, and they would know okay, that's not something we should roll out. Yeah. And then uh, the last one we got was Caesar was asking for getting the actual URL for the link. So if you can post it into the comments, I'll be good gonna. Otherwise, I'll put it to the notes. Was it bitly bit bit slash something? Oh, sorry, like uh, uh, so what's uh, in your outbox so that, button? That's to that's to our uh, blog post actually. So we do have a blog post which. Um, you know, describes, let's say, an earlier incarnation of that. But then there's a link from the blog post to the examples repo too. So you've got everything if you go to this URL. Okay. I just pasted it in the chat. Well, I copied it manually. That's manual copy-paste. 
<laughs> That's what you do. Okay, so we are up. I think we got through all the questions. There was one question, by the way, just so we have the five minutes about uh, Pinoy, who's asking about. Uh, I can't find it right now. He's asking about. Uh, he was a Panache. Spring Boot user. Can you use Hibernate Panache yeah. with Postgres extensions? Uh, I don't know if there's. A, you shouldn't be able to, but if you have issues, I think the best thing is you open an issue or go on Sulip and ask that specific question for there. Okay. Yes. Anything else? No, I think we're good. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have any favorite topic, just go for maybe you can show it on a on a browser to show how you vote to the your favorite uh, next topic. Oh, Kafka uh, streams yeah. should be great. I hear people want to see this. <laughs> well, the Good. next one is uh, the next one is part two of Mutiny. So if you have been uh, thinking about uh, uh, the reactive library and have more tough questions with uh, higher level patterns or whatnot to for Clement, yeah. then this will be next week. Good work. Okay, guys. After that, everything is open. Well, we have, well, 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 so everything is closed. But you know, well, we got we, we got something else. We're waiting for Jason to confirm if you want to do a what was it. Uh, Concept of philosophy of Quarkus. It's a more generic one. So and I got, I got one on. more actually. I also can do something with my uh, Lucene extensions. I've been working on a serverless search yes. based on Quarkus. So that's also pretty cool. You will happen to. Yeah, so I recommend people, um, I think you blog uh, or tweet, but you know, go, go follow Gunnar because he's always on weekends like having interesting experimentations. <laughs> it could be very low level. Java, you know, latest edge version, you know, experiments and playing with. Yeah, he's been playing with Quarkus and Lambda, uh, you know, Lambda, uh, Lambda as in AWS Lambda to do a search engine. So, you know, interesting uh, feedback on the, those technologies. Well, that, that's where I got the App CDS idea from, from seeing Gunnar's tweets. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm like, not... yeah, we got to do something with Quarkus with this. Yeah. Those By people... the way, App CDS is good to start faster. I don't think it solves the memory problem. If anything, it might take more memory for. Uh, yeah, when I tried it, it didn't take less. Yeah, it so like... it's it, it's it's. I mean, it's neutral on the memory by itself. Where it makes a difference if you were to run multiple processes on the same host, which mm -hmm. you typically don't do in, in terms of Kubernetes and so on, right? I mean, this would be super interesting if you could do this across container boundaries. But uh, so usually the memory impact isn't there, but for startup it's interesting. And I like it because, well, usually if people think about fast startup, they think about native compilation and VM and all those kinds of things. But really here you get also a faster startup for the JVM and it's pretty much for free. So you just, you know, you get it with all your libraries and so on. So that's a nice uh, tool in the box. Also, Kafka, just for uh, using Kafka during testing, it will start up much faster if I use it with FCDS. So that's just a nice uh, productivity boost for myself. So, and just the last comment yes. from Manic saying he was waiting for the extension for static site search. I saw you were doing the yeah, um, Lambda I'm, I'm function. Working <laughs> yeah, <tuned>. working on it. <laughs> cool. And also, you figured out how to, to not spend too much money on Amazon, right? The <laughs> budget thing. So I hope I figured that out. Uh, well. <laughs> The blog post will be so successful that with AdWords, you will be able to, you know, get money to pay for the US. That's a that's Ponzi scheme, essentially. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Awesome. No pressure at all. All right, guys. You're on 4 o'clock. So, uh, yeah. Thank see you guys you around. Thank you uh, for being we'll there. Sign up. Sorry Thank about you so last much. week. Just we had a point. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Oh, and do something.